Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see a good d number of you back. We had a great group last night, and I know some of you, uh, th is, this is a first, but I am going to be sort of, what I'm going to cover this morning is something of a continuation, but in a different key. Uh, the issue specifically that I wanted to focus on here was the relationship between evangelization, personal faith, disposition, and sacramental grace in the producing of the fruit which God intends that the church should, should bear in the world. So that's sort of where I'm coming from here. Now, it was very interesting. Some years ago, I was speaking at a theological colloquium on the parish. Uh, can you tell me what a parish is? And I, uh, there were, you know, ecclesiologists and constitutional lawyers and many weighty academics in the room, and then there was me. And I represented the pastoral voice. Um, and it was very interesting. As I was listening, it was fascinating because they had a brilliant uh, professor from Rome who teaches at one of the pontifical universities there. And he was articulating a sort of this a state-of-the-art uh, understanding of the role of the pastor. But what was fascinating is I listened to him, and it was all very illuminating about, you know, the, the teaching, sanctifying, and governing munis or tasks of the priesthood, and, you know, this is what it meant to teach, and this is what it meant to sanctify, etc. The thing that was really fascinating was the laity weren't there at all. 99% of the church was missing from the picture. And when they talked about, when he spoke of teaching, there was no reference to anyone learning anything. When they spoke of sanctifying, it talked about this is what a priest does, but there was no reference to anyone actually becoming holy. I was, it was truly uh, kind of stunning for me. I ran outside, my um, co-founder, uh, Father Michael Sweeney was out there because he was taking a smoke break, right? And uh, so I ran out, I said, I cannot believe it. I have read about this in history, in church history, but here it is, you know, in the 21st century being, this is what is apparently being taught to seminarians studying in Rome right now but there's no laity there. There's no relationship. There's no one to receive the pastoral office. And there's no one bearing fruit. I said, you know, it was, it was just stunning. And so now I might add that this wonderful guy who did this presentation totally supports our work. He, he himself absolutely gets it. But when he was just attempting to describe, of course, you know, in a briskly and in a cogent uh, fashion, the church's formal understanding in this area, most of us, certainly I and other lay people, were not there. Now, it's fa I found it fascinating because this is exactly what we see in practice often at the parish level. A tremendous emphasis on all the things we do, and we don't ask what the impact is, we don't ask what the fruit is. And this was very early on in my own Catholic life. I am, a, for those of you who don't know, I'm a convert as a young adult from sort of the evangelical fundamentalist side of the spectrum. So I was always asking questions that gave other people hives. <laughs> I gave Catholic hives anyway. Um, and one of them is I went to the woman who was in charge of religious education for the archdiocese because I wanted to understand how Catholic schools worked. And especially I was really intrigued, how do they pass on the faith in a meaningful way to children? So I said, okay, help me understand. How do we, how do you evaluate what the children come out of a Catholic school when they graduate, what they carry away with them in terms of their understanding of God and the faith and their relationship with God, discipleship, etc. 
And she said, well, we exposed them to so many statues and so many liturgies. And I said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Okay, but how do you know what they believe, what they know, what they, you know, what they're living when you leave? I mean, how do you know what you've effectively passed on? And she said, oh, that's a delicate spiritual mystery. We just don't go there. In practice, and I think often out of a fear of being judgmental, of being elitist, uh, a number of terms that I've heard used, there's just this sense that we, we, we do what we're supposed to do, but we do, but the whole issue of the impact and the fruit that is actually born is something we've just kind of set aside out of the fear that it is totally, in a sense, it is totally God's business. And of course, ultimately it is. But to even look at it, to even ask these questions is somehow invasive, disloyal, not appropriate. It's, it's been fascinating. There's a cultural norm here that I've run into in many, many places. Now, so that's what I want to, I want to look at what does the church actually teach in this area? And at is especially what are the implications at a, a practical way at the parish level? And I know you all know that those of you who are seminarians here, I'm sure you've heard this. The ministerial priesthood is at the service of the common priesthood. It is directed to the unfolding of baptismal grace in all Christians. And the unfolding of baptismal grace. Now, there is a huge topic, but that's what it's directed for. I love this. This is a very early quote from Pope Francis, actually almost two years ago now. He said, a good priest can be recognized by the way his people are anointed. Years ago, when I first got to know Father Michael Sweeney, and this was before the Institute, before we started working together, I hardly knew him at all. In fact, I wasn't entirely certain in those days that priests were human beings. <laughs> you come from my background, you gotta understand, okay? My, one of my, my younger sisters saw a Dominican, you know, because I was at a Dominican parish, and he obviously in habit with the giant rosary that clanks, you know, that's like 15 feet long and goes boom, boom, boom every time you... So he's clanking his way up to us. She pulled me aside and she says, how close can you get to them? <laughs> because, well, first of all, who knows if they're an alien, really? And, and now that I've worked with Dominicans, that is, a, that is actually a good question to ask. Um, <laughs> and... And she, I think she thought there was like some kind of force field or, you know, designated, I don't know if it was 40 feet, 50 feet, whatever it was, you just, you know, these, these unknown creatures. Well, I was still kind of in that mindset, though I'd been Catholic for a couple of years. Father Michael and a group of my friends and I, we were all, we were just all disciples. We were all incredibly enthused about our faith. Some of us were converts, some of us were cradle Catholics. But it was, uh, in many ways, we were just all on fire and it tried to figure out what it was God wanted of us. And in some ways, it was like being in a room of puppies. You know what I mean? Like, just sort of fill, you know, you're just jumping around full of energy. He turned to us out of the blue, I'll never forget it, and he said, you are the evidence my priesthood is bearing fruit. And I, I remember going, what? A, we're a pretty scrubby lot. B, you're talking like you're a person. Like you don't know. We ask those questions. We're asking those questions. What are we supposed to be doing? What does God call us to? But you're, you're a pastor, you're a Dominican, you're a priest. I mean, come on, don't you know? He was really, of course, talking about governance, but I didn't know that. He was saying, my priesthood 
is directed to the unfolding of baptismal grace in you, and I am seeing it unfold. You are my fruit. In the New Testament, the Greek word for fruit, karpos, is not, it, it's concrete. It refers to a deed or an action or a result or a profit or a gain. In other words, there's something real world about this that you can actually respond to, you can recognize. That's why Jesus was constantly saying, you can recognize whether somebody, the tree is bearing good fruit or bad fruit. So these are not just fantasies. They're not projections of our psyche on the universe. They're real. Fruit is real. And good fruit is something that real people can recognize, can respond to. Jesus in John 15 is very eloquent on this subject. We cannot bear fruit unless we remain in him, the true vine. We can do nothing apart from him. If we remain in him and he in us, we will bear much fruit. It brings glory to the Father when we bear much fruit. We show ourselves to be disciples when we bear much fruit. Jesus chose us and appointed us to bear fruit that will last. The issue of the fruit, as opposed to just the activity of your ministry, your vocation, and mine, is truly a critical question. In practice, now here, this is just, again, based on our experience to date. In most of the parishes, the over 500 parishes that we have worked in, most places the cultural norm is not one of discipleship. It is one of those, at the, or as I said last night, at one of the earliest and most passive levels of spiritual development. If that, in an in a organization where that is the cultural norm, in a community where that is the cultural norm, what that means is you will see little or no fruit. And we have come in many ways to accept fruitlessness as normative. That's why you could have a theology of the priesthood that makes no reference to fruit. That's why in practice, we could operate as though if I do X and Y and Z, I'm done. And I don't have to ask what happens. In practice, not in our theology, our theology is filled with amazing references to fruit and its importance and its critical nature. Every single one of the sacraments is supposed to be bearing a specific fruit. The liturgy is very clear, the church is very clear, that liturgy is supposed to bear a specific fruit in individualizing the community's life. But we had gotten used to little or no fruit. And that has shaped our pastoral practice, our parochial culture, the lives of every one of us here, and our mission to the world in profound ways. The church also teaches that your fruit, all of the fruit of every single person, belongs to the whole body, which means your fruit belongs to me and my fruit at some level belongs to you. Again, this is a, we're talking, we're, we are talking communion of saints here. We're talking communion. But the reality is, whether I know you or not, I have any sense of what God is doing you or not, the fruit you bear 
at some profound way empowers, liberates me. And my obedience and the fruit I bear somehow strengthens and nourishes you. And it's true for all of us. So large scale, wide scale fruitlessness is impoverishing all of us and the church's mission. Now, when I like to freak people, poor seminarians out, I do things like this. I sort of lay out in a long list, there's, there's a whole bunch of these I can do, about what priests are called to do. I, we were doing, ha, poor man, we were um, doing this at a seminary in uh, another state, and uh, a, a poor deacon who was about to be ordained in three months came up in a panic and said, nobody shared that. They haven't talked to me about this at all. And now they're telling me there's all these other things I'm supposed to be doing and I'm not ready. I've got I've to figure it out now, you know. But look at this. Priests are called to collaborate with lady in the mission to the world to listen to the lay people, recognize their expertise, awaken and deepen lay co-responsibility, confidently entrust duties to the laity, invite lay initiative, help all the baptized explore and discern vocation. The churches, the church explicitly teaches that the church's mission is fulfilled when she helps every baptized person answer the call that God has given them. Form and support secular apostles. There's the references down there. Also, in their spare time, priests also get to do this. <laughs> I, just, I just thought I'd let you guys know now, okay, so you can start working on this. Um, all you have to do is recognize, uncover with faith, acknowledge with joy, foster with diligence, appreciate, judge, discern, coordinate, and put to good use, and have a heartfelt esteem for all the charisms of all the baptized. So let's get on that. I expect, you know, a report tomorrow. No. But seriously, this is governance. This is an, both of these are essential parts of the munis, the pastoral munis of governance. And as far as I can tell, in most of the, I've, I've asked about this everywhere. It may be very different here, I don't know. But in the other seminaries where I've asked, I said, what, what formation do you give to your seminarians about governance? What classes do you teach? What books do you, you know? And basically, the answer is nothing. At least that's what I've heard so far. And Father Barron, you can fill me in on why that is not true here. I'll be, that'd be, no, seriously. Because I would love to be able to say it's happening here. You know, really. St. John Chrysostom says something quite wonderful in his six books on the priesthood. He says the most basic task of the church leader is to discern the spiritual gifts of all those under his authority and encourage those gifts to be used to the full for the benefit of all. Only a person who can discern the gifts of others and humbly rejoice at the flowering of those gifts is fit to lead the church. What is interesting, especially when you, um, St. John Chrysostom wrote quite a bit about the charisms. He, in one passage he says, and it, it really makes this very poignant, he says the church is like a woman with a beautiful jewel box, but she opens it and it's empty. He says, where are the charisms? Because in his day, he, they were vanishing from common public experience. He knew they were a critical, essential part of the apostolic faith. He said, where are the charisms? What had happened, there were some historical reasons behind that. As you know, of course, the church of Christianity had become public, and in one century, the number of Christians had grown 500%, so far as we can tell, as historians know, in one century after it became legal and the, and the emperor became Christian. And the result was we had a massive number of nominal Christians, people who were simply 
getting baptized because that's where the power was shifting. And the charisms, it was interesting, simultaneously became associated over time with those who went out into the desert and began what we now think of as monasticism, the religious life. They were looking for green martyrdom, as they sometimes would term was. The charisms over time became associated with those people who led ascetic lives. And meanwhile, those lay people who were living in the late Roman Empire were sometimes looked at as compromised in their faith. Somehow they weren't, weren't really serious. This was never formal teaching, but at a popular level, when you read the documents, the assumption was the charisms came, went with monks to the desert and with the early mothers to the desert. To the point, by the time you get to the 8th century, the last really serious uh, conversations about charisms that we're aware of for several centuries were in Syrian monks. They were talking about the charisms, but they also simultaneously believed that you had to be celibate to be saved. So the, the union in, in some people's minds between the charisms, those gifts, and ascetic life had become very, very firm. What happens though, when we don't have disciples, is that thing, fruits like the charisms don't manifest. They are given to us, we receive them, this, if you will, the power, the potential, we receive the power in baptism, but like so many of the other graces we receive, objectively, in valid sacraments, they do not bear fruit in our lives until the point when we begin to say yes. And that, so in many ways, the church is, just like we could echo St. John Chrysostom and say, the church is like a woman with a beautiful jewel box. Where are the fruits? We open it, and there's so little fruit there. There should be more. We know the church's tradition says there's supposed to be more. The sacraments, this is all, now the, this next stuff is just very, very basic, and I realize it's repetition for most of you. The reason I'm going over it is simply I want us to think about this at a practical pastoral level. The sacraments, of course, signify, make present the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. And that is the issue before us. And this will all look distressingly familiar. Um, the sort of the, the basic, uh, you know, traditional scholastic divisions here. Um, the sign, the formal sign, the external rite, the character that sacraments like baptism, confirmation, and ordination bestow, if they're valid, or the ecclesial effect, and then what is known as the res tantum, or the grace effect, or sometimes is referred to as the reality itself. These are sort of three aspects, dimensions of a sacrament, okay? And the reason I'm laying them out like that is because we want to look at what makes a sacrament both valid and fruitful. We're presuming here they're all valid. If, it's, if, the, if the sign, the rite has been properly performed and there is uh, the person intended to receive the sacrament, the character is bestowed, that is, that is a valid sacrament. The issue, however, that that does not yet address is, has the grace effect been bestowed? So all the things in red are the traditional signs, and in green, I put them in green basically to say that these are the issues that are part of the sacramental equation that most of the time we do not deal with in practice. Disposition. Most of the time, in practice, at the parish level, many, many times I've heard people say, well, we're, you know, we're uncertain. The kids that we're confirming, many times, I mean, I've been part of these conversations even the last couple of weeks. 
children who will tell you openly they don't want to be confirmed that their parents are making them because they've reached you know the age that it's done in this diocese they feel the pressure they will tell you i don't i don't believe this i don't want it the parents will not listen i mean you can try and say you know your child is really indicating they're not interested the parents are not interested because they're on a timeline this was a task one of their many tasks, they're overloaded. And as far as they're concerned, they are checking things off their list of being a good Catholic parent. And they want to get this done. So the, the, the disposition of the child being confirmed or the teen being confirmed is a real question. Have, will they have, have they said in the end, yes, I will, I will choose to be confirmed? But disposition is more than that, as the church understands it. And so that the grace effect is truly received and it bears lifelong fruit. So how does that work? This is fascinating. This is, when I came across this originally as a description of the disposition that adults are supposed to have before they are baptized fruitfully, my initial response, honestly, coming from my background, was that Billy Graham had written this. Because the language just, you know, triggered echoes in me. Things like, that I am justified by God's grace through the redemption of Jesus Christ, you know, that I begin to love God, that I know I'm a sinner, that I trust in the mercy and love of God for Christ's sake, that I'm moving freely toward God. Except, of course, Billy Graham did not write this, I'm sure you know. This is from the Decree on Justification from the Council of Trent. It is 400 years old. It was written in response to the challenge of the Protestant Reformation. That's why they were grappling with these issues. But this, if you have lived all of this, if you have moved to initial faith by hearing the kerygma, if you believe that you're justified by God's grace, if you're beginning to sh love God, if you understand you're a sinner, that you need to repent, that you trust in the love and mercy of God, that you resolve to receive baptism, to begin a new life, and to enter into the obedience of faith. That's what you call a disciple. What is interesting, I was in Rome with Father Michael some years ago, and we were talking to a cardinal uh, in the Vatican. And he turned to me out of the blue, I don't know why, and he said, what percentage of adults do you think who are received at Easter into the church through RCIA, what percentage do you think are still practicing a year later? I was thinking really hard because I knew the number wasn't good, but I really had no idea. So I, it was just a, a guess on my part, a shot in the dark. I said 50% are gone in a year. He said, oh no, it's 70%. Now, I couldn't find any statistical sources for that for many years until, I, until recently when I came across some research that Kara has done. And it seems to reinforce this because they found, when you do the math, that only about 30% of all of us who entered the church as adults are at Mass on a given Sunday. So a lot of us are missing in action. And, and we know from some of the studies some of us don't even return to Mass on the second Sunday of Easter. We're gone as soon as we leave. People who have lived this don't do that. Many, many, many of our people go through our CIA, which is potentially evangelizing dynamite, I mean a more powerful process for evangelization hardly has ever existed. But for a lot of our people, probably for the majority of our people, so far as I can see, the U.S. bishops did a study in 2000, they found that only about 12 percent of the adults, young adults going through RCA were on a personal spiritual quest of some kind. 
The rest of them were there for marriage and family reasons. And all the evidence is a lot of our people are simply changing religious identity, but they are not making the journey to discipleship. And the fruit after the fact shows, shows that. The church teaches that there are for adults, this is different than it is for infants, but really how grace works in the life of an older child, a teen or adult is very different. Now our personal response is critical and we can have obstacles. Lack of faith, lack of understanding, lack of desire to lead a new life, lack of repentance. One of the, in my, in my book, I tell the true story. This is not something I experienced. It was a, somebody else told me about it. But literally, he was in RCIA class with a man who the week after Easter, in, in Mystagogia, thanked the whole RCIA team for not making him wrestle with Catholic stuff. That apparently he and his sponsor went off and watched football while they were supposed to be meeting, you know, to discuss about his journey into the faith. He was doing it just to please his fiance, and he was so grateful to the team for their cooperation. I was talking to a sacramental theologian last month, and he mentioned that. He brought that story up, and he said, you know, that guy, there's a chance that wasn't valid. Not, not just not fruitful, not valid. I'd be, I'd be talking to him if you could find him. Ludwig Gott, the well-known um, dogmatic theologian, I like his phrase, he says, the subjective disposition of the, the person who's receiving the sacrament is the indispensable precondition for actually receiving the grace in a transformative way. It is objectively, if it's valid, it is objectively present, it is made objectively available to us. But for it to be communicated, for it to be brought into our lives, released in our lives and begin to change us, we have to say yes at some level. So the indispensable precondition. And it's not just whether or not you receive the grace in a simple yes, no. It's how much grace you receive. Now, this totally blew my mind. I love this image of Aquinas because, of course, I live in Colorado, and we're into skiing. We like winter. Winter's really pretty there. But if you are out skiing, and it's, you've gotten cold, but you stand outside the door of the ski lodge and don't go in, you stay cold. Aquinas says the graces of baptism are basically like a fire that is setting its heat out in all directions. The fire is making the warmth available to anyone in any direction. But you have to get close to the fire to get warm. That's the factor. And he says adults who approach baptism are not equally disposed. Some approach with greater, some with less devotion, and therefore some of us receive greater shares of the grace of newness and some smaller shares. That the, the, but the same amount of grace is available in theory to all of us. One of the big factors is how hungry, how open, how ready am I? If we're talking fruitful baptism, not just valid baptism of adults, evangelization addresses that indispensable pre, you know, sort of precondition. Where are you? How are you saying yes deliberately to the grace? Are you entering into the obedience of faith? Are you believing and following Christ? Are you moving toward love of God? Are you repenting, taking responsibility for your sins? That addresses it. In fruitful baptism of adults, that in theory should happen beforehand. It should happen before they receive the sacrament so that the disposition is in place at the moment they're baptized, the grace effect is fully received, and they start to bear immediately that lifelong fruit. And of course, it's a lifetime bearing fruit. It goes on for a lifetime. 
But Thomas is a, also a realist, and he points out that some of us who start off very well because we're hungry at the moment we're baptized, in many ways like people who are passionately in love the moment they get married, and 10 years down the road they're not speaking to each other. We can do that with God. We can be very hungry, very open. At the moment we receive the sacrament, and later on, we grow cold, and Thomas says, we can baffle grace, which seems astonishing that mere mortals, mere, mere human beings could baffle God's grace. But that is what we're talking about, where somebody else, maybe, who was baptized, who was going through it semi-comatose, you know, just completely in a perfunctory manner, they go through an awakening later, and now they're on fire, and the grace has now been revived in their lives. So disposition, our response, is a lifelong issue. That's what the church talks about, revival of the grace of fact, which is very interesting. Not only Baptists have revivals, we have revivals. This is from Father Contula Mesa, the preacher to the papal household, but I, I like his, the way he puts it. He uses this image of the valid but tied sacrament. It's tied because the fruit that should accompany the sacrament remains bound because of certain blocks that prevent its effectiveness. What is causing the fruit to stay tied? The opus operantis in baptism, man's part, consists of faith, of personal belief, personal faith. And he says, when we contribute our part, namely we make a choice of faith prepared in repentance that allows the work of God to set itself free and emanate all its strength, it's like a plug is pulled, it's like the light is switched on, the gift of God is untied and the spirit flows through your life like a fragrance in the Christian life. That's what we do when we're evangelizing adults. That's what the new evangelization is doing. Father Michael Swinney used to like, he used to laugh, he used to say, evangelicals who were, in a sense, reaching out to lapsed Catholics, and of course many evangelical megachurches are filled with former Catholics, as we all know, and some of them are like half Catholic in areas like Chicago, which has a very heavy Catholic population. And Father Michael used to say, he says, the evangelicals don't know they are poaching on sacramental grace. The grace has been made objectively present. The character has been bestowed. But what was missing was the explicit proclamation of the charisma, the call, the explicit call, that's one of the things we're finding in evangelization. Very few of our people are given explicit, safe opportunities to say an explicit yes. We don't give them the opportunities. Now, in the world I came from, we were so terrified that you may not have gotten the message that at every single service I attended as a child, there was an altar call. Even if I'd already heard it in the morning, they had an altar call in the evening. And if, you, I'd already, you know, if I'd already even gone forward, I remember even at, at like age 12, I would sometimes feel like I just wanted to go forward again, you know, just to make sure. Because after you listen to the 10th verse of Just As I Am for the 250th time, they were just afraid that somehow I may not have heard it the previous 249 times. Where our practice is different, we seldom give our people clear, explicit, safe opportunities to wrestle with, will I say yes? But it's really critical, especially when we're dealing with people who are baptized as infants but have not yet said that personal yes if they have grown older. That's what we're doing when we evangelize the baptized. They've validly, of course, received the sacraments, but now we're calling them to that yes that provides the disposition. The result is the revival, the term is used, of the grace effect. This is, of course, referring to the sacraments who bestow characters that cannot be repeated. So we are talking baptism, confirmation, ordination. There the graces have to be revived 
because you can't repeat it again. And then fruit begins to be born. The fruit of our sacramental lives is personal, but it is also ecclesial. So for every one of us, the fruit is life for God in Christ. There's a, a life in the spirit is also a term that you see throughout. It's very interesting. It's repeated over and over again to try and describe the personal impact. But the fruit is also for mission and witness. And just briefly, I've been looking at baptism just briefly in terms of the liturgy. This is, of course, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium. But notice it says, before men can come to the liturgy, they must be called to faith and to conversion. Therefore, we announce the glad tidings of salvation, etc., etc. And to believers also, that is to those who are already baptized, the church must ever preach faith and penance. She must prepare them for the sacraments. The way it is put in the catechism I find very interesting. This is a section that is entitled Liturgy as Source of Life. And there's only two sections in it. The first says the liturgy involves the conscious, active, and fruitful participation of everyone. In all the discussions I've been listening to over the last several years about what active, conscious participation in the liturgy means, I realized in prep preparing actually for today, that I had never heard anybody talk about fruitfulness. But the two are deeply connected. And then it goes on to say, the liturgy must be preceded by evangelization, faith, and conversion, and it then produces its fruits. The fruits being new life in the spirit, involvement in the mission, and service to the church's unity. To the extent that your parish and my parish is essentially in a maintenance mode, that is a lack of fruit. Because the church says the fruit of the liturgy you know, is involvement in the mission. To the extent that we are riven by all, and I don't need to spell it out for you, we all know, all the conflicts, all the polarization. That indicates a lack of fruit because the fruit of the liturgy is service to the church's unity. And I do love this. The assembly, not just as us as individuals, but all of us together are to become a people well disposed and the preparation of our hearts is the joint work of the Holy Spirit and all of us, the assembly, especially its ministers. But notice this, the Holy Spirit is awakening faith, conversion of heart, and adherence to the Father's will. These are the precondition for the recipient of the other graces conferred in the celebration and the fruits of new life, which the celebration is intended to produce afterward. All of this is simply to say this. The fullness of the sacramental economy includes initial evangelization. It is an essential precursor because that's how you address the issue of disposition. We have tended in most of our discussions and in our practice, we tend to, you know, the, we see the liturgy for itself and we spend, we just focus on it sort of in isolation. But the whole economy says evangelization, faith, conversion comes first and fruit follows. When we don't see fruit, we need to say, what's happening in the area of conversion. The liturgy is never supposed to stand alone without reference to the disposition of those present and without reference to the fruit it bears in our lives. Basically, we are fruit farmers. And I use that because most of the time, and I use this all the time, I use the parable of the sower a lot. 
And I know a lot of us have done that. We're preaching, teaching, it's a wonderful image. We use it all the time. But I'm speaking here as a gardener. Anyone who's a serious gardener or farmer will tell you, you do not cast seeds just for their own sake. Nobody does that. You, you sow seeds in order to grow something. In the end, all of us, especially those of you who are discerning a call to priesthood, who are being formed for the priesthood, which of course is all about your primary purpose of the priesthood is the unfolding of baptismal grace in the baptized. But it's true for all of us in our own ways. Any one of us who are involved in leadership or ministry in a church setting at all. Ultimately, the evidence that my ministry, my vocation, my priesthood is bearing fruit is the emergence of new disciples and apostles around me. And the fruit that God bears through them that, you know, into the world, that the, that the Holy Spirit bursts in their lives. And so, yes, by all means, we want to sprinkle those, we want to sow those sacramental seeds everywhere. But we're sowing them because we are working toward a harvest. And we are not done when we sow. That's only the beginning of the process of making disciples.